This is the I'm Possible Project show, where we interview real people who have achieved incredible feats in the face of overwhelming odds, showing that impossible is just a state of mind and that anything is possible. I'm your host, Joshua Rivetall. Today, in episode 40, Resplendent Rudy, I talk to Rudy Caceres. Let's jump right in. Rudy Caceres, and uh, he's a new friend. I've known about him for a bunch of years. He's actually in L.A., and we're doing this live. I think this is like my second or third live interview, and I'm stoked. Uh, We're hanging out in Roxbury Park in Beverly Hills, very close to my home. Please don't stalk me. Um, And uh, Rudy has a great story. I only know some of it, so he's going to fill you in. And uh, he's a mental health advocate. I know he lives with mental illness, so the story is powerful. And I'm not going to say too much more. His bio is going to be in the show notes. But Rudy, man, I'm so glad that you made the 40 minute trek to join me. I actually flew in for from Muskogee just for this. <laughs> you flew in from Muskogee. You flew in on your with your Ford Explorer, whatever you're driving these days. <laughs> so, dude, man, that was probably one of the worst bios I've ever given anybody. Sorry about that. So, if you wouldn't mind. Can you give us a little background of your life, where you've been, where you're going, the Rudy Caceres experience? Yeah, no, and we, we've known each other for a while. I was actually, I was years. actually supposed to re- be in your book, but I got too lazy to submit something. All good. <laughs> it happens. I was almost too lazy to release it, so yeah, we're in I was not possible. <laughs> <laughs> Until today. Bum, bum, bum. Yes. Um, you're welcome to pay back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Way better than written word. Oh, shit. Yeah. So I'm Rudy Caceres. Um, I'm a mental health advocate, which is a word I love using because, like, that is such a, like, different people have different um, interpretations of that. But I've lived in Los Angeles my whole life, to be specific, San Pedro, near the coast, near the port. I live with bipolar. It's... It is what it is. Sometimes I hate it. Sometimes it's uh, it's so much a part of me where I couldn't imagine not living with it. So, and I'm just turned 30 last week. Really? Yeah. So I go around sharing my story. Um, started off small. Um, just doing like I remember my first presentation I did was uh, at Pepperdine University, September 21st, 2015. Like 10 kids, <laughs> kids. They're, they're like they're in 20s. They know more than me. Mm-hmm. And then I gave my 102nd presentation just uh, last Sunday. So Jeez. yeah, you man. Yeah. So I love doing that. I also make videos for different organizations. I work with different brands as well. So I love talking about mental health. Um, mm-hmm. It's kind of my it's kind of the only thing I like doing. <laughs> like, <laughs> I suck at everything else. <laughs> you are possible in the world of mental health. Yeah, man. We've connected on this topic in several different ways. Bipolar. When did you find out? When were you like diagnosed? When did that happen? Um, to be succinct, basically, uh, I've always dealt with mental health issues my entire life. Like usually I've just been depressed and having anxiety and like really socially awkward as a kid. Didn't feel like I had any real friends. Nobody loved me. And so I'd get bullied around a lot. So just complete mess. And, um, so I mean, healthy adulthood that of course made, but one of the things that did help me was, was theater, um, helped me get out of my shell and build my confidence and be, um, a better version of myself, which was weird because I thought like like I I I, sh- I didn't have to have theater in my life to be um, the person I should. But it's, it's so weird how that works out. About how I'm just like <laughs> yeah, no, you're good, you're good, you're good. Um, I'm 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 in it, I'm in it. Yeah. Um, let me backtrack. Um, so one of the things that helped me was theater because it helped me get out of my shell and help build my confidence. But and I, I tried doing that for a few years in college and that helped. But like after like three years of going to community college and not feeling like I could ever make it, like I thought I was going to be like the next Jim Carrey, but I could not go to an audition at all. Like like I was so afraid to try to like go for an agent or try to make a demo reel. So I decided to join the army. Because that's the obvious alternative. <laughs> um, so I, I, I couldn't find a job either. And I was just so I, so unmotivated to do anything. I always knew I wanted to do something great with my life. I wanted to be somebody. So if I couldn't make it as an actor, I was going to be this great American hero. Um, and that was a bad idea too. Because as soon as I started I in the Army, I was just miserable. I, I can't shoot and save my life. I've never been in good shape. I can't work a radio. Like I almost like killed my platoon like throwing a grenade. Because I can't, I can't throw it all. So over and over, day after day, I'm just feeling miserable. Like I made the wrong decision with my life. Um, 
it was really hard. I did graduate from basic training, but I went on to intelligence to train in that um, in Arizona. And I'm thinking, like, I'm going to do all this James Bond type stuff, be like, like hacking the mainframe and like getting to see the UFOs and all that stuff. <laughs> and it so wasn't that. It was basically like working on like PowerPoint 92 and like like the <laughs> slowest technology ever. And just the anxiety kept building up more and more, feeling like, man. I made the stupidest mistake in my life because this lifestyle is not meant for me. I don't have any friends again. It's even worse than high school because it's not like there's like a theater troupe yeah, <laughs> that yeah. I can go into. <laughs> um, so, and it got so bad that I basically had a breakdown. Like I went to the dining facility one day towards like, remember like the halfway mark um, of my, um, of my training in Arizona for intelligence school. And I had a breakdown. I had a catatonic episode, completely froze up. And uh, I got taken to the emergency room. Like, they had to pick me up out of the table and put me onto the stretcher. And I stayed there for a while. And then when I got back, I was so embarrassed. I didn't want to tell anyone. And I eventually ended up going to the psych ward um, in Tucson for seven days. And I, I, I thought, like, my life was over. Like, I was so embarrassed. Like, I was in the, the quote-unquote crazy house. Um, and th- it, was, it went downhill from there because I was discharged from the army and actually the day that I left um, was the day that everyone graduated so everyone's in their suits everyone's hugging their families and kissing their kids and everything and I'm going back to LA with nothing to show for myself and I didn't even talk to my family during that time because I didn't want to tell them that the reason why I'm coming back is because I had a breakdown there's no celebration there's no party there's no medals or anything like that and I didn't tell anyone for the longest time at the time I had a, a diagnosis of schizophrenia of catatonic schizophrenia but it later got changed to bipolar because I had a manic episode in 2014 um, as I was um, going, trying to go back to college, trying to find my life, still a mess. This is like 2014. I got out of the Army in 2009, so that's just like five years of just directionless, feeling like my life is basically just going to be laying around in bed all day, smelling, having people feel sorry for me, not ever working, never having a relationship, all that stuff. And so I had that manic episode because I was um, head of this, this club on campus where we put on mental health events. And I thought I was the greatest thing in the world. And I thought like no one, no one quite understood. No one gave me the appreciation that I did. Like I can take this to the next level. I can be the ruler of the world. If people just gave me the chance, I have all this passion, all this need to be someone in the world and people are trying to hold me back. People are trying to say that I'm manic, that I'm sick, that I'm sick. I'm not sick. You're sick. You're sick. And I had that crash because no one, no one understood me. No one ever, no one ever made me feel feel as if I was doing something right in my life. I always felt like a failure that I, this whole mental health thing of coming out, trying to change the world, that it was all wrong that I just wasting my time. I had that crash and I became so depressed. And that's when I um, finally decided to get help for that, um, trying to manage that. Because when I was manic, I didn't want to get any help. I didn't want to take meds. Like I'm cured of depression. And you get back to depression again, the worst depression in my entire life. That's when it's like, okay, like I, I give up. Like I need some help. I need, give me whatever you, any, I'll take it. Any med, like any injection, whatever. It's please help me because this is so bad that I just want to die. And you, you got help and you found your way out to treatment. And what a hell of a story. I mean, I didn't know 95% of that. And uh, so I, ne- I never know what we're going to talk about when I do these interviews, but holy cow, man. So these different extremes, one to the next, what did help eventually look like when you were like, I got to get, I got to get out of this, that was there some final straw? Was there like, you know, uh, sort of a Mary Tyler Moore moment where you're like, well, you know what I mean? Like, really- yeah. Well, I was, I was working with a therapist at this time at my community college, and it was great because she was, she was actually a, um, a PsyD intern, like, working um, towards her doctorate degree, and so she was, very, she was very new. She was only a few years older than me, so she totally got it. She understood where I was coming from. She wasn't trying to, like, diagnose me. She wasn't trying to, like, make me do, like, homework and all this stuff and, like, put me in a box. She wanted me to be the best version of myself and wanted me to believe that I'm worthy of being loved 
right now because in my head when I was like 25, 26, I thought I had to have a career. I had to at least have a master's by now. I had to have I had to have a relationship because with all, all that stuff, like that means that no one loves me. That means that I'm mm. not successful. So, I mean, we had to spend week after week and thankfully I had that privilege because um, other healthcare systems like expected like you go through like eight sessions of CBT cognitive behavioral therapy and you're you're basically good to go kick you right back out and you're good um so I was able to talk to her every week for the entire school year and that's what it took because I had to like basically like retrain my brain to realize that it's not all about all these things I think I should have it's those things are bonuses if those things never happen that I'm still worthy of loving myself now it just so happened that I had that manic episode in the middle of all that. And so I got, I went from thinking that I, I finally have confidence in my life to thinking like I have like the wrong kind of confidence. I am, I'm basically a jerk to people. I'm thinking that like I'm invincible, like, like no, like everyone is out to get me and trying to like find that balance in my head. Like, you know, when I was doing theater, one of the, one of the, worst or most interesting pieces of direction I've ever gotten from a director was that like Rudy, um, like, uh, like you're, you're good and all, but like, you're a little bit too in the moment right now. And like, I think she, I think she had meant that I was like, like it was like, overacting, but in my head, I was thinking like, well, what, how should, I've always been told that I have to be in the moment and you're telling me I'm too in the moment and now I'm lost. Now I don't know how to act. I don't know like where, like what to do now, and I felt that same moment, um, that same feeling, when I was told by my advisor in that club is that like Rudy, like you have all this passion in your life, but like you need to find a, like other hobbies. You can't just do this mental health thing. Mm. You need to get a real job. And I was, I was thinking like, well, well, maybe like you're wait after arguing with her for like an hour, and I was thinking like you're right. Like this, what was I thinking? What was I thinking that I, like me, that I can make anything out of this? And so it helped for me was basically first trying to accept that I had bipolar, but to not feel as if like that was the end of the world, that it's like, okay, well I'm bipolar. So that means like I can just like lay around all day or I can go back to hating myself. And so thankfully I was able to find a therapist after that who was, wasn't as like, a meaningful connection, but it still, it still helped me during that time. And the main thing really for help is, um, being able to share my story. So, cause in those years between the army and getting coming out, I was so ashamed. I didn't want to tell anyone. So different people have different coping skills and pe- different ways of being able to get help. Some of them, it's like, they have to have like a strict um, a med regimen or like a strict sleep regimen or they have like different hobbies in their life. For me, it's always been about sharing. And so that's helped me. Like when I tell my story, I wish I can just do it every single day because that's truly the one thing that like drives me and it helps me deal with it all. And that's, that's powerful. I mean, there's so many, there are a couple of different comments. I mean, first, like the therapy piece, right? Like once we find that right therapist, the one that we click and connect with, it opens up a different world, you know, and it makes me feel a little bit sad when I hear people say, well, I tried therapy and I'm not going to do it anymore because I so-and-so did this or I had a bad experience. I'm like, oh, please, like get a second and a fourth and a 15th opinion, you know? Yeah. And the fact that like you were fortunate enough and I've been fortunate enough to, to have those people and to have it click pretty well on, on my end, click relatively quickly, I feel very fortunate, you know? Um, and then... Uh, this idea of, of, of wanting to be like loved, you know, it's like, that's like a very human thing. And we, we like wrap all this thing and I do the same thing and I've done the same thing. And, and my, my head is switching just like yours has like, Oh, I need this. Well, nobody's going to like me until I get that, or I can't get married until I have this amount of like, who does that? And we do that. We're people. Right. But yeah. like, but really what it comes down to is we're worthy of being loved. I think just for existing. You know, and it's up to us to fill in the space and the void. And the other thing, your story, sharing your story, the the effect that it has on the storyteller, you. Yeah. You know, I've I've had a couple people on the show that have mentioned the fact that like you sharing your story, meaning me, but I'm saying this to you now, that sometimes it helps you more than it helps the other people. You know, like not that everything should be therapy on stage. I don't mean it like that. Yeah. But the fact that you're able to make a positive impact on people's lives, that's huge, you know. 
Yeah, and and you know, you know the thing the thing is about the whole being loved is that when you actually have someone who loves you, you feel as if you don't deserve it. You feel like an imposter. It's like, oh well, once you get to know the real me, or you just say that like you don't really mean it. So mm-hmm. it's just something that like, I know me and others like we deal with our entire lives. It's just just been a hard hardwired like that. It's hard to to retrain ourselves. Um, mm-hmm. um, about helping. About helping me, it's it's you know, it's, it's weird because sometimes I think like, is this is this selfish? Like, is it is it um is it is it should should it be okay that I feel good when I make others feel good? And like, I don't I don't know I don't have an easy answer to that. I just know that I <laughs> I do feel good. I mean, I've done presentations where I felt worse. I felt like I bombed. Yeah. Like I felt like nobody cared. And so, I mean, it's, it's, so it's, so it's a mixed bag. And I don't know if, if anyone ever tells you that it's like never about themselves, like when they're on stage, uh, I think, think there's think that's not completely true. No way. How could it be? I mean, there's, there's an element of somebody was telling me a friend of mine, a, a pretty well accomplished psychotherapist and a couple other degrees was like something about people who, who have this want and desire to be uh, applauded or to be to be recognized preachers i'm missing it. it's definitely preachers and public speakers for sure and actors so oh, yeah. I, I actually have th- all three of those covered because I, I i married a couple friends of mine so i get i get to call myself rabbi or preacher or whatever anyway back to you man i, I go on tangent sometimes i'll remember that when i get married <laughs> right yeah uh, oh, thank you thank you indeed uh happy to help um, <laughs> uh, maybe I'll find you somebody too. Yeah. Work on that. <laughs> <Thanks. laughs> so Covering all bases yeah. here. I'm possible project marriage. Inv- no, <laughs> man of many hats. Yes, oh, some of them don't fit too well, but <laughs> um, no. But you're right about that piece. And in my head, I was thinking, oh, the homeboy is overthinking it. You know, it's getting a little existential. But but every now and then, it's okay to think about that stuff because. You want to make sure your heart is in the right place, you know, and, and I, t- I tell young people or people who are just fresh in the in the speaking uh, world, even though there are going to be moments where it is about you, yeah. the large majority has to be about the audience you're speaking to or, or whomever you're speaking to. Because if, you know, if you don't connect with them and it's all about you, you're going to feel worse than when you showed up. People can usually tell, too, when someone is self-indulgent on stage, like even on, even like a preacher, like, mm-hmm. like trust me. And so oh, yeah. I, I do I do worry about that because uh, it's it was different when I first started where like I'm just talking about like I'm just thankful to be like out get out of bed and now I have some success but, like it's so hard because like I don't want to like like brag but it's like these are things that like I never thought I would ever achieve such like getting awards being able to travel doing all this stuff and it's just it's hard because like I don't ever want to feel as if like I've lost touch with my audience but. I always want to be able to to share my story. Mm-hmm. I think you know, Rudy. I think I think one way that that might you know not fix itself, but one way that 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 idea won't cross people's minds. It's just a matter of how much you give after the fact, you know, because people are going to want to talk to you, and I'm sure they do all the time. They want to like they share their story. Yeah. Or those instances where you feel it's appropriate to share your email with them or something, and there might be a little bit lengthier of a connection. You're not getting paid for that. You know, and that's that's okay, you know. But I think I think it's okay to to show people because one of the things I tell people about living with mental illness and one of my goals beyond decreasing stigma and 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 making sure people don't suffer is I want people to see that someone living with mental illness can like be what societal norms deem normal. You know that whatever that means. I still don't know what normal means, but but what like I make pretty good decisions. I try to contribute to my community and, and that kind of a thing. And so I think, I think that's, you're doing that, man. You're showing people that you can be in a dark place and still kind of come out on the other side. And yet you also say, I still struggle. You know, I have days where I struggle, which is powerful. And I think just my humble opinion is that because of that vulnerability, that honesty, you're going to keep connecting with people. Yeah. I hope, I hope it's never a day where it's like, man, like I totally get you guys. Like the other day I couldn't afford to add the avocado at Chipotle. Right. right. Like, I get you. I get, I get you, man. Like the struggle is real, yo. Like I like never want, problem. yeah, I know. I never want, I never want to be like that, but so it's, 
So it's weird. And like, and like part of me is like, it's, it's, I feel like I can't give enough. Like you ever, you ever feel like that? Like you wish like, like you, you have people like they're doing like fundraisers and doing all these like charity events and all stuff. And like, you just wish that you can just like give so much more of yourself and your money and your resources and just feeling like, 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 like even like, like, like sitting down or like, or like driving around your car thinking like, man, like I feel as if like I, I should, I should be doing something like meaning, like more meaningful instead of like focusing on myself and like taking like, like I should never have like self care. Like, do you ever mm. get like that? I do sometimes. I'm like, well, I just don't have time. My kids are doing this, or uh, I'm supposed to show up for this speech, and then I have them one the next day. I'm like, wait a minute, dude. You have control over your calendar, by the way. Yeah. And like, you just can't give. You know, I I, I do feel that, and I, and it and it doesn't go away. But I think what I've I found different ways to counterbalance that from time to time, like especially travel schedules, like my yeah. my cru- you know my Achilles heel because I'm just I want to do as much as possible and as much you know just can't do you know yeah I know it's more of a problem with people who are just starting out, especially if you don't have sure. like wife or kids and stuff like that. Where you, where you go from a point where you get no work, you have nothing going for you, and then like you start to get some tension, you get offers, not all of them are like speaking in the capital or anything like that. Yeah, like I've done psych wards in front of like two people. Um, but I just, I, I just got to keep moving forward. Like I don't want to, to stand still or feel like I should be doing something meaningful with my life. But I know, um, that that's not sustainable. I know, um, a lot of like, um, of my, the people I look up to, they're speakers that they're very good at being able to say no, um, when not that they're selfish, not that like they don't care about your you or your organization, but it's just like there gets to a point where they do have to take care of themselves. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm I'm so glad that you brought that up because um, well, first of all, that was something that I struggled with early on. You know, I was like, I'm going to do this, 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 and this, and it wasn't a huge problem in the beginning because it wasn't like people were like busting down my door or anything like that. Yeah. But but at the same time, it got to a point where I was people were kind of calling on me, and I was still pitching my work and stuff, and. I just over overtax myself, you know, and yeah. in the name of wanting to help, wanting to make a couple bucks, uh, you know, it's tempting, you know, and, and to, to all those all those people new in the field in any field, really, it's this it's this really delicate, like high wire act of this push and pull. Right. Like it's the surrender to like, I don't know everything. I can't do everything. And then also like I got to put my foot on the gas, too. Yeah. It's this weird push and pull. Do you find that? Yeah, because like you have to have a certain amount of confidence and drive but th- but you don't also want to be like arrogant and like come off like ru- like rubbing people the wrong way but it, and and like you have to be able to make money but like you don't want to be that guy who like who makes it about the money like if you don't give me a certain rate then go screw so yeah um that's and that, that's one of the things like some people where it's like they're very concrete it's like this is, this is this is the only the organizations I will work with. This, this is my rate. There's no there's no going down below or anything like that. I'm not available on these days or you know you know that whole deal where they have like the sure. whole package. They have the whole package and everything. And so where it's like with, with me, it's like I still want to give so much of myself, but yeah. still wanting to to feel like I'm in charge. Yeah, and it's possible. It's really possible. And I think. Um I think that what you said about people being super stringent about, you know, self-care and that I understand. But when it's really kind of about the money or or like very, very strict with dollar signs or whatever, I think there's always ways to add value and to kind of mix it up so you can still give up yourself. And I think some people make that mistake. And I've got some I've got some learning to do myself about sometimes giving too much away, you know, yeah, which which is in intrinsically you know it's it's not the worst thing in the world it's i think it's better than not giving anything but at the same time like it does have a, a negative effect too you know yeah but i, I want to call to attention just the fact that like because you said i i, I want to give as much of myself as possible and i think what this show is about and i think like what what i'm doing with this and why i do this because i want to highlight people who do that you know yeah. and um and just hear their experiences and their stories i don't think we've had anyone with bipolar on the show just and yet. I think part of that is still rooted in the mania of just wanting to, to to really make an impact in the world. Like not like to like where like, I think I'm Jesus or like anything like that or like but I want to be a force in this world for good. I, I want to make an impact. And so a part of me is just like how can I how can I do that? If it wasn't with acting, if it wasn't um, in the army, like how can I still have that impact in this world? And for me, at least right now, it has been sharing my own story. 
and it's and it's proved to be impactful. I mean, you said 102 presentations. That's at least 102 people, no, but it's more than that. And I know you're doing a lot of Facebook Live. I know you're doing some stuff with the Mighty. And it's it's. I, I told you this one of the more recent times that I emailed. I, I told you I was proud of the proud of you because I've been following you for a couple of years and I've been seeing your growth and it's really it's really been quite nice to see. Yeah, and I I appreciate it because you 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 reached out to me a lot earlier than like I where I became more successful, which is only like in the past like twelve months. Mm-hmm. And you reached out about me before even that, and so that. That means a lot, and especially um, other people who live in LA, because like we're, it's great that people are speaking about mental health worldwide. But it's always good to have those connections near to you, where I can just like drive to the park and yeah. even do a podcast with you. That's amazing. I love it. Um, so, so definitely. I mean, I'm, I'm thankful, thankful for the support you've given me. My pleasure. Yeah. I mean, we got to stick together. I mean, first people to people, but I think this 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 industry can be taxing. You know, the field can be taxing. Uh, it's definitely worth it and worthwhile, but the more support in, in our corners that we can give, you know. I mean, I know people provided support for me as I was coming up, and and, and even when I was an actor, but uh, definitely in the mental health field. So I'm always like, pay it forward. Yeah, you know, forward. you know, one of, the, one of the issues, though, is that people where they, they want to be a mental health advocate, and they even part of them, like, kind of wants to be famous, but they can't deal with that attention. Mm. They, 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 they buckle under the pressure. I see it all the time where they think it's all about like getting all the followers and getting all the right. awards and everything. But it's like, it can be very overwhelming at times. It can get to the point where you lose friends, you break relationships, you lose jobs, all this stuff. And it can be, it can be a really taxing lifestyle and where it's it's not it's not really it's not really um the best kind of lifestyle for someone who already has mental health issues. Yeah. So, but no, like, not. but like I, I it's like it's like the cat's already out of the bag. Like I'm already sharing, and the more I've shared, the more vulnerability I've I've, I've expressed. Anytime I've ever doubted myself, every time I've ever doubted, like oh, like that's kind of embarrassing to talk about, or I think people are going to hate me for saying this. It has always paid out, of, like even more than I could have imagined. So I'm. This is the life for me. And there are times where I think like, is this like, is this worth it? Like, is this, is this going to work? Am I going to fail? Like I failed at everything else. So I think it's going to be always an ongoing process. You know what? You're not alone. You're not alone because I, you're, I'm, I, I would say I'm doing fairly well in life, uh, financially getting a certain amount of speaking engagements and curriculum and blah, blah, blah. But there are days I'm like, am I, am I going to screw this up? Am yeah. I going to? Is this going to all fall out from under me? And then what am I going to do? <clears throat> am I going to be driving an Uber and be a crossing guard? And like, well, not, nothing wrong with that. Not really the life for me. Yeah, and there like, might there might even be times where you get jealous of other people, and like it gives like brings out emotions in you where it's like, I'm not this. I didn't. I'm not this person. Right. Like I. Why? Why? Why do I care about this or that? Like why? Or and so and and especially if we're someone with bipolar, where it can bring out the dark side in you and trying to manage, manage that. It can just be really hard because the last thing, one of the last things you'd want is for people to think like, Oh, well he's just like all the other crazy persons. Like, yeah. okay. Like he talks a big game. He talks about like getting life together and everything with push come to shove. He's just crazy. Like all the other people. Mm-hmm. You definitely don't want to have the opposite effect. I mean, that, that does way more harm than good because at least before that, they weren't in touch with somebody who's like a charlatan or whatever. And now, you know, you're you're, you're that guy. It's fascinating. I was like thinking like the seedy underbelly of, of the mental health speaking world. Like you could get jealous and you're – but, you yeah, know, I, 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 but I, there I, is some shit going on down – you know, yeah, there's like, some isn't stuff that, going isn't on. Isn't that weird like in a, in a field <laughs> where like everyone should like like be loving and like, like so supportive of everything that you still have – elements of other industries yeah. that, that competitive edge that like mm-hmm. underhanded type of stuff and it's just it's it's so weird because it's like it shouldn't be like that and yeah. yet it's that we're still people yet we're yeah. still vulnerable to those those same uh th- dark aspects of the human the human psyche survival instincts and jealousy and yeah any of that stuff i mean it happens i i, I find that i'm not encountering it as much as when i first started yeah. But thankfully, so I don't know if I, I would say it's probably not eradicated, but I've just surrounded myself chosen and I've been fortunate enough to be able to, choose, to to surround myself with people who 
aren't in that mindset, you know? And I've got to pull myself away from some of those mindsets at times too. Yeah. I'm like, wait, no, the pie is for everybody and we can grow the pie together. Like there's no reason like I need, I don't need the whole pie. Yeah. Like I'll, I, yeah it's, instead of, it's instead weird. of arguing about a small pie, let's all try to make the pie bigger. Not to get like all heady with metaphors and everything. No, but, no. Like, <laughs> we make the pie bigger, <laughs> yeah. everyone can get a spot. But if you try to argue, like try to like fight over like small, same small pie, yeah. it's going to get smaller. Or the crumbs. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and it could be whatever pie you want. You like blueberry, you like pizza. I don't care. Rudy, I want to switch gears for a minute. Um, not pineapple pie. No, hell no, not pineapple pie. I don't even know if that exists, but it sounds terrible. <laughs> I mean, Marie Callender's. Maybe that's May or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love Marie Callender's, by the way. They actually have restaurants out here. Now I'm living in L.A. Switching gears. Switching gears. Let's talk Marie Callender. Um, actually, dude, I want to do this thing called the quick fire round. And because, like... Is there a quick fire music that you would play during this time? Boop, boop, boop. I should have that, actually. That's a good Quick one. fire time. Quick fire round, 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 um, like a monster truck. <laughs> yeah, we get a chance to see. We, you know, we on the show we talk like social justice and like it gets deep and sometimes it gets dark, and which is cool it's because dark. We, yeah, it is. Well, <laughs> outside we're under, but um, it's uh, but but I want people to see a different side, especially people live, like living with mental illness, because it's like okay, we're not just. Even if we're, like, out being advocates or whatever, we're not even just that, you know? Like, we're silly, we're funny, we're weird. This is just that, man. It's like the Inside the actor studio or or I'm Fallon interviewing my celebrity guest. So, um, Am I allowed to swear? I was like, you're asking me if I fear it's swear words? Yeah, you know, I, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Sometimes it's, you know, I have some clean episodes, I have some dirty episodes. We'll just play it by ear, my man. We'll just play it by ear. Because <laughs> yeah. I swear a little bit sometimes, too, and I'm trying to figure out whether that's okay or not. So far, I'm okay with it. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, I played right into your hands. So, Rudy, what is your favorite word? Fuck. <laughs> I'm, just I'm just. Can kidding. we get an alt? <laughs> alt fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Um, actually, my favorite word is resplendent. I just like the word. The word. Maybe it's because it starts with an R too. It's really elegant. Resplendent, Rudy. Yeah, I like that. That'd it's be, like, yeah, that'd be my purpose. What does it mean? Resplendent, resplendent Rudy. Resplendinator. I think this means good. Okay. Just another word. It's fancy. fancy yeah, fancy yeah, word. yeah. It's very snooty. No, it's not. It's yeah. fine. <laughs> snooty. That's another. Snooty. It's another good word. What, so what's your least favorite word then? Um, geez. That, now, that, now that's something that I was not prepared for. Um, like other than like obvious like racial. Like, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> what like, can you say? <laughs> <laughs> snack trays. Snack. <laughs> Why? Uh, it's a hyphenated word now. Uh, is, is that, yeah. <laughs> so just what came to mind off yeah, the top? Yes. Zork. Yeah, yeah. Zork. I said, somebody asked me that recently. I, I could, I was like, fudgems or something? Like, I couldn't think of a word. So if somebody made a movie of your life. Irregardless. Ir- oh, that's not even that a is, word. That, yeah, I know. I, anytime, actually, I, any, any word that's not a real word that people still insist on using is a word that I hate. Supposedly. Horrible. There's no B in that word. There's no such thing as a library. But you, you're allowed to call it the refrigerator. I do. I what do I call? I call it the fridge. Refrigerator? Do I call it the refrigerator? I might sometimes. Now you're gonna make me think about it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so if somebody made a movie of your life, let's put it on. Let's put it on C-SPAN. Let's put it on C-SPAN. It's the, their, C-S- their, C-S- their first C- foray in the script. C-SPAN, C-SPAN eight. The Ocho. The Ocho. 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 <laughs> Who would play the title role of Rudy Caceres on C-SPAN, the Oak Show? Uh, Orson Welles. <laughs> like the hologram. <laughs> I like that. You'd be like Lawrence Olivier in that um, Sky Captain in the Royal Tomorrow movie from like yeah. 2003. That is the most interesting answer I've ever gotten. And I think it's probably my favorite to date. Like, we're going to go back in time <laughs> or we're going to have a hologram. Dig his ass up. Yeah. You get out here right now, Mr. I don't care if you're all bones. <laughs> Jeez. I know it's cold out here, but damn. <laughs> Orson Welles. Just collect those awards. <clears throat> you're going to get yeah, more and more and more. Jesus, man. Let's see. What else? Oh, uh, this is one of my favorites, actually. So who or if, what? If, 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 um, if, if Orson Welles did come back from the dead, that would be literally an RKO out of nowhere. It would be a what? It would be an RKO out of nowhere. Did him his old studio. Oh my god. It's <laughs> amazing sad. and horrible at the same time. That one's for free, boss. Yeah. So Rudy, man, let me think. Okay, all right, this is one of my favorites. So who or what is your spirit animal? Who or what is your spirit animal? You guys actually, you know, it's actually interesting. I had a conversation with about this. Um, I made a post about this where there are people who find that term offensive if you're not 
I am Native American. I have okay. Apache blood in me. Okay. But there are people who find that offensive. Is that um, right? Yeah, like like cultural appropriation. Oh, you know, I didn't think about that. The question for me actually is not. Uh, we don't have to answer that if that if that's something that that bothers you. No, um, no, that is. That is, that is I, I mean, that's not. That's not like um, like we we could go on like another podcast episode about that. But that is that is. Um, I've, I found that interesting about how some things people were like, "Well, you're too sensitive. Like, why can't you just like like take like take joke?" And others are like, "Well, yeah, yeah." But uh, that, is, that is it's it's the same thing within the mental health world where they're. People don't like certain words that start stigmatizing, yeah, yeah. but they're they're also like the same people who are like, you know what? People are too sensitive these days. Like, you can't say anything without people getting offended. Yeah, I know, I know. Except, don't say this. That's very offensive to me. Like, yeah, okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, it's but you're right though. And and for me, like, if you told me not to, I wouldn't do it because that's your experience, man. Like, I, like I don't really agree with it, but I also don't have that experience, and I also. I mean, I don't really have a culture that people often appropriate. So, um, (laughs) but, uh, and and honestly, for me, it's just kind of a fun question because like, I I, I say who or what? So so most people are like, well, it's an animal. So I'm like, you could say Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I don't care. (laughs) Like whoever's your spirit animal could be your spirit animal. You could say uh, your your patroness. Oh yeah. Yeah. What would that be then? Seagull. (laughs) <laughs> without, without, without question, Siegel. San Pedro. You're right on the right on well, the. Well, you know, yeah. It's actually, um, if you know the um, the playwright um, Anton Chekhov, Anton Chekhov. Siegel is my favorite play. I, I, you know, I've actually I've never seen it live, um, but I've always wanted to play Constantine, the main character, mm-hmm. um, and it's just something that's haunted me throughout my life. It's one of those those plays that I will never f- forget. Maybe maybe every single part of it is just still stuck with me. We should figure out a way to put that on as like some kind of a benefit. I tried writing. I tried adapting it for a modern version once. Okay. Like not not even like calling it the seagull, just just having like those same like types of characters and like Mm -hmm. same like basic plot. Yeah. But yeah, that is that is as interesting because she has it's because I've I've always kind of related to Constantine in some ways and like but then there's also Nina that also it's like both. I always felt like maybe like those were just like the same person. Like that yeah. was just like who that Const- the kind of person that Constantine wanted to be, but just was too afraid to be. But then like the person like Nina, like later on in the, in the play, she just loses her mind. Mm-hmm. And it's like, is that really who you wanted to be? And, like, mm. so we could, we could I totally love break that plays. apart. I love checkoff plays. Uh, yeah, it's weird. I don't even like any of the other ones. Oh no. <laughs> I, I, Uncle Vanya bored me. Three sisters. I like three sisters. Yeah. Um, three sisters. Um, but Cherry Orchard. Is, is, yeah, 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 yeah. But Seagull Man. Yeah. Yeah. Seagull. Okay. I like that. That's that's hilarious and amazing. And yeah. I, I can just there see was a that. version in New York once, <laughs> like in 2002, where Philip Seymour Hoffman played Constantine. Mm-hmm. At when he was like like 12, 20 years too old, because Natalie Portman played um, Nina. Well, that's Meryl that Streep played star casting. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, I could I could riff on theater all day too. Um. All right, so uh, I will say that I mean you, you might you might think this too that um, since I don't really do theater anymore that that public speaking has become as close yes. as I can get to that. Yep. And mm-hmm. since like I was always like a fringe character, like I never got the lead. I always wanted like they just gave me a chance, like just let me shine. Yeah. And so we're here where it's just like just just me on stage. You got you you elevate your persona a little bit, like you have to just a little bit. You know, you have to be a little bit heightened. So you're in a like one percent. There are times, though, character. where I wish I was not playing me, where mm. I could be the bad guy or I could do yeah. all this and stuff without people thinking, like, oh, that Rudy's got problems up there. Like, what's going on with him? Yeah. So so it's in that in that vein, then, like... It's what, like when you're on stage, you're allowed to be manic. Yeah. 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 So I'm, I was actually curious, like, so two things, like, what would you what would be your ultimate protagonist to play and what would be the ultimate villain for you? Um, you know, it's weird because, like, like, like I, I would cons- I would consider Constantine a protagonist, but it's weird because like I like the characters who are like not clear cut dry the hero, uh-huh. but like have good intentions. Odysseus. It's not like that whole Wicked West of the thing where it's like you're trying to like like justify her evilness, but it's mm-hmm. like their heart is in the right place. They really um, like have good intentions, at least yeah. like how society would see it. They're just like so screwed up through situations or have just like don't really have the right support or don't believe in themselves and just trying to make the best of that but not like uh like like rudy in the movie like i wouldn't want to 
play that. That did not have a payoff, okay? Yeah. Like, he made, like, a sack, like, when they're already winning the game. They're all, so yeah. Don't get me started on the movie Rudy. <laughs> um, but I used to want to be Ferris Bueller. Ferris Bueller. Like, for the longest time. And it's weird because, like, I didn't watch that movie until, like, maybe, like, like 2000 or 2001. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be uh, actually kind of, like, I, I like to think that that the characters of later um, um, Matthew Broderick movies, because yeah. he usually plays, like, more of a nerdy character, I always want, like, like the cable guy and stuff like that. I always yeah, want to yeah. believe that that's still Ferris Bueller. And he eventually, oh, yeah. Yeah. like, got proven to be a fraud. Like, he talked all his big game, but he just couldn't <laughs> back it up. I like that. I like that. So, Ferris Bueller. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. So, I could, you know, I could see you kind of rolling out a Ferris Bueller sort of a role, you know? Yeah. It'd be fun. What about villain? What about villain? Um, like, I, there are, there are, like, I've always wanted to be the type of villain where, he like, he, like he mostly like sits like ninety nine like ninety percent of the movie like ninety nine. There's like that one scene Job of the Hutt. where like he get he gets up and just like, <laughs> like it'd be like it's like talks like very slow and just like very calm and collected, but can just like totally like kill anyone at any moment. Completely just can like just like you, you're dead now. And then like just they collapse or something. Like Jeremy Irons in every movie. <laughs> no, yeah, right. Well, yeah, I know, but like, but like very elo- eloquent though. Like, yeah, very, yeah. very, very like like calm and collected, but also like very powerful and like like and doesn't die at the end. Those are always oh, the best villains because the Emperor in Star Wars, I mean, you get him. You know, he's got some elegance to him. He was a senator, and then but he yeah. dies. But like spoiler alert. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, delete. <laughs> yeah, uh, the villain, the villain who who never dies. Okay, I dig it. We'll figure that out. We'll have to figure that out. Um, I guess like Claw from like Inspector Gadget. Did he die in that movie? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, Another Matthew, Matthew Broderick movie. Yeah, right, right, right. I remember that. Yeah, that's hilarious. So <laughs> I kind of want to. Ch- I want to change directions again, but I, I want to. Um, I think that's the end of. That's definitely the end of the quick fire. Quickish fire. It was round. very quick. It was super <laughs> quick. Um, okay, so if if people want to get in touch with you, you know, find out, you know, hire, you know, get you speaking for the organization or rock with your Facebook lives or whatever. Like, what's one of the best couple ways? Or AshleyMadison.com. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> um, the best way to get it and hold of me is definitely Facebook. And I know that's not everyone's cup of tea. Um, I mean, for me, I love Facebook. I don't always, I never got the hate, like why people, um, don't, don't use that a lot. And like, I've, I've, I have my biggest following there. Um, and it's completely public. So, um, I always share mostly on there, but I've gotten more into Instagram and Twitter lately. I've tried to take it more seriously, but I am at Rudy Caceres, one, no space or hyphen or funny symbol or anything <laughs> but yeah facebook instagram and twitter there is a rudy com, but like i haven't updated that thing in so long okay. um <laughs> and so if anyone if anyone's out there wants to to help me with that like yeah because like i because like I, I i hear like mixed things about like there's some websites are still relevant in the year 2017 and like i'm, I'm sure like uh up and down yeah so but definitely um those are the three best ways and i do facebook live interviews uh once a week, I just had one um, yesterday with his name is Michael Pearson. His, he was a board member. He is a board member of the National Alliance of Mental Illness, and it's great because I I've met him a couple times, and he has lived experience too. So it's it's, it's great to have um, that kind of experience on the nas- on a national board of a major nonprofit. So I do that every week, and uh, lots of exciting things happening. I just had a story in the Mighty about suicide, so I love. I love sharing on different websites and working with different brands, different organizations. So a lot of times people know me from other things that like yeah. outside of my own, my own social media. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I look forward to continuing to share my story, whether it be on stage or in video or any other audio any sure. medium. Yeah. Well, I, I'm going to keep watching from the sidelines and, and support where I can. And uh, and we talked a little bit about some connection prior. Yeah, and I'm, so. I'm, I'm, I'm and I'm I'm really thankful that we were finally able to make this work. Yeah, me too. Me too. I'm glad we got the chance to do this, hang out in the park, get a chance to talk. Man, it was like a seriously like a real treat, man. It was cool. Great, appreciate it. You've been listening to the I'm Possible Project Show with Joshua Rivetall and guest Rudy Caceres. I love sharing stories and how to turn impossible into I'm Possible. If you want more inspirational stories, our second and third books are available right now. Changing Minds, Breaking Stigma, Achieving the Impossible, as well as Lemonade Stand. 
Both contain powerful stories of overcoming tremendous odds. When life gives you lemons, squeeze, add sugar, and pick up a copy of the I'm Possible Project. That's IAMPossibleProject.com slash two slash T-W-O or IAMPossibleProject.com slash lemonade. Thank you so much for tuning in. You're more than a community. You're part of the I'm Possible family. Until next time, sending you lots of love.